the amazing thing about these family units, right, that we live in, that we flow through life within is we can make our life whatever we want it to be. Ever feel like you're in a constant competition between your career and your husband's patience? Your kids think you work too hard, but hey, you're doing it all for them, right? The struggle is real, and I've been there too. Moments of feeling like a crappy mom and wife because once again, your kids had breakfast on their way to school. And you've got more important things on your plate than cooking and cleaning. Hey there, working moms who are juggling a million things and still wondering if you're doing it right. I'm Veronica Cisneros, and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, a mama of three, and married for 24 years. Welcome to the Empowered and Unapologetic podcast, where we dive deep into the messy, chaotic, and sometimes hilarious world of mastering motherhood, marriage, and business. I get it. Balancing it all was never the goal, but here we are trying anyway. I'm here to share my journey and guide you through yours. No more apologies for being driven and definitely no compromises on your dreams. Together, we'll navigate the challenges of being a powerhouse in both business and family life. Join me as we tackle the uncomfortable conversations from being the breadwinner to changing the rules of what a marriage looks like. Let's figure out how to parent in a working parent household without the constant arguments or guilt. I'm Veronica Cisneros, and this is Empowered and Unapologetic, where we embrace the chaos, challenge the norms, and strive to live life on our own terms. Get ready for some real talk, actionable tips, and a few laughs along the way. Hey, ladies, welcome to the Empowered and Unapologetic podcast. I'm your host, Veronica Cisneros. Today's guest, Lori Sugarman Lee, believes deeply in the power of families and it is and is a passionate voice in the cultural shift aiming to articulate the value and visibility of unpaid work. Her career as a communication strategist, combined with a decade devoted to full-time care for family, community, and children's charities worldwide, served as the inspirational backdrop for her professional relaunch as a coach, speaker, and author. She is dedicated to fostering meaningful conversations within families, encouraging them to contemplate how they care for one another and their shared space. Lori, her husband, and two sons are Canadian-born and live steps from Lake Michigan in Chicago. Welcome, Lori. Hey. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm excited to be on here with you. Can you share with us the journey that led you from a career in communications to becoming a coach, speaker, and author focusing on family dynamics? I would love to. So I enjoyed a 15-year paid career as a marketing strategist, um, my, most recently working for Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts, a really fabulous gig uh, prior to having kids after having my first child became slightly more complicated with the travel Mm -hmm. and the flexibility that I tried to negotiate with the company wasn't on offer at the time. This was, you know, coming on 14 years ago. And I thought, you know what, why don't I take my, you know, desire to perform at a high level and contribute at a high level and pivot that into the economy of care. And I took the lead uh, on raising my children full time and getting as involved as I possibly could in the community and their schools and in charities. And it kind of took me by surprise how much I enjoyed and thrived in the role. Um, It gave me the opportunity to move our family internationally twice in elevation of my husband's job. Uh, we lived, we, we were living in Toronto. We moved to London, England, and now we live in Chicago. When we landed in Chicago, um, in fact, each time we move, we have to update all of our guiding family documents like insurance and wills yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. And my husband who 
very strongly valued my um, contributions in unpaid work, uh, said to me, <laughs> we should get you, we should get you disability insurance because if yeah. anything happens to you, um, you know, I would have to take a leave from, from work. You know, we were living away from our whole family network. We didn't have a safety net. It was just really the four of us. Um, so I went through all the rigmarole and jumped through all the hoops of applications for disability insurance, only to be told by the insurance agent um, that I was de declined, rejected. Oh. And when I questioned him as to why, he said, well, you don't receive a salary. So if something happens to you, there's not really a quantifiable loss. Yeah. And I said, excuse me? And he said, no, we don't value homemakers that high. And it was such a oh. bubble bursting moment for me of the systemic devaluation of unpaid work and the work of care. And it really set me on a mission to speak about this work and the value of this work to society. As of now, it isn't even counted in the GDP or any other economic indicators of our society. Yeah. Um, it is, you know, supposedly just this labor of love that women contribute endlessly and inequitably to the elevation of our society, but it isn't counted. And when I thought about how I could make an impact to that, I looked back on the past 14 years of my life, really mm -hmm. fully committed to my children, children's schools and children's charities. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I can, I can speak to children in a way that can be cycle breaking and, and impact the future of care. And so I wrote a children's book. I love that. I love that. I love your story. Um, and oh my gosh, like, I don't know how I would take that if somebody told me that. Like, cause I've been a stay at home mom as well. I, I, I've been there where, and I'm gonna tell you right now, that was hard. That was some hard work. Um, yeah. You spent a decade as a full-time caregiver for your family, community and children's charities. How did this experience yes. shape your perspective on the value of unpaid work with families? Like, so we have this man saying like, we, I, I can't believe that even came out of his mouth. Right. And what yeah. I like, that would only like, like push that drive to do more. Well, that's what, it. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. And, and it was a realization that it started with me. You know, if yeah. I was lit, if, if I was lit on fire, which I was by the percent. fact that, that he was so dismissive of, of this work, which was mm. thousands of hours. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's the joke is, you know, when you're, when you're a new mother and you're told that breastfeeding is free, well, no, breastfeeding is 1,800 hours a year if it's wow. going well, right? And so yeah. this, the, the work that we know and the, the statistic really is that globally women and girls carry 75% of the unpaid work of care yeah. on our backs and it's measured in girls as young as eight. And so this is really, um, it, it, it's an everybody issue, but for women, it's becoming a wellness issue that that needs to be addressed. And I thought- if I want people to value this as work, yeah. then I need to treat it at work. And, and the first thing I did was I made myself a LinkedIn profile. Yeah. And I listed all of my achievements, all of my growth, all Good. of my contributions in this unpaid stage, right? And it was fascinating to reflect on it. And I tell women you know, when they have new babies, they very often keep a journal of all of the baby's milestones, a, mm -hmm. a record of all these special moments. Right? And I recommend do this for yourself as well, yes. because this, this stage is full of growth and full of evolution and, and absolutely constant contribution and achievement um, that are worth noting, you know, that can be used in a return to work scenario where you where you're not talking about this as a gap, right? I mean, this is a massive learning phase for any parent that should be acknowledged by future employers. It's a very, very powerful stage in a woman's life. So talking about it as work and assigning a meaningful value to something that isn't paid, right, but mm -hmm. is an incredible contribution to society that the work of care is the work that makes all other work possible. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. 
In your opinion, what are some of the biggest challenges families face today when it comes to recognizing and valuing unpaid work? So the biggest one is that so much of this work isn't visible, right? I mean, it yeah. happens sort of silently and magically. I mean, women are making it happen mm -hmm. whenever they can fit it in. I mean, if they work outside the home, they're doing it before and after that work, early mornings, late nights. They're doing it when children are sleeping, when children are at school. And so much of the work of care um, and the work of the home is mental and emotional. And mm -hmm. so women are carrying it all here, right? We know women carry this more than men. Um, and so the reality is, is that it is invisible. And so it's, it's so hard to understand the scope of it, which really is massive. And you need to understand the scope of it before you can appreciate and connect it yeah. to value. Thousand um, percent. And I think also the energy that we sometimes give to this work when we call it like chores or whatever is, it's complicated, right? Because the word chore is really defined as something that's tedious or difficult or repetitive or unappealing. But really, this is the work of nourishing and nurturing and creating self and safe and healthy spaces for our family, protecting our investments like our home and our car and at its core, it's really the work of gratitude. And, yeah. you know, I know it's it's heavy. It's a mm -hmm. lot. We're often doing it when we're exhausted. But reminding ourselves that at it, its core, it is the work of love and gratitude may help how we approach it. And then our children will see us connecting with it in that way. Well, I, and I think it, there's that added part to it with you know, I, I appreciate you saying we should keep a book of like all of the things we've accomplished because we have all of those mile, milestones for our kids. I just started doing that. And it was like, how many, right. how many speaking engagements have I participated in? And mm -hmm. I didn't even remember. And it was just like, why don't I have that written down somewhere? Like yeah. that would be like, those are things that I've done. I never thought I would do it. And now I'm doing it. You know, right. or like, you know, if I was in a magazine, like what are the titles of the magazines that I've been in? You know, like things like that. And it's like, it's, you know, as, as we're working, we're doing certain things, it's, it, it becomes something that we put on the back burner. Um, so I love, love, love that you, um, you know, are recommending that women highlight their achievements because we are so much more than a um, mom right? We're so, mm -hmm. so much more than a mom. How do, we, how do you believe the cultural perception of unpaid work within families has evolved over the years? And what do you envision for its future visibility and appreciation? And this question is really big for me because there's a lot of women who started off just as yourself as a stay-at-home mom, and then they're now publishing books. They're now coaching. They're now doing so many beautiful things to go to serve outside of the home. Mm -hmm. So I think um, there are still a lot of societal norms that of complicate how we see this work. Um, there's a lot of gendering of the work that has been going on for generations. The perception that it is, you know, primarily a woman's role to guide and support the family. Yeah. Um, messages around the importance of paid time being much more valuable than unpaid time. Um, Eve Rodsky, who wrote the book Fair Play, says, you know, an hour holding your hand's child in the doctor's office is just as important as an hour in the boardroom. Mm. Um, and just understanding that there is so much value to this work beyond the generation of revenue. Yeah. Um, and so, so starting conversations and, and starting a process to unlearn sort of at the yeah. societal level, yeah. um, but also understanding that really the opportunity is to impact your own family first and then let that flow out into society, you know, by working on equity in your own home and the implementation of systems in your own home that allow this work, which can be a very heavy load, to be done much more efficiently with a reduced amount of stress and a reduced amount of, you know, duplication of effort and yeah. nagging and all mm -hmm. these things, resentment, all these things that creep in. Um, and, and make it just like less of a feature in our everyday so that we do have more time for connection and self-care and creative pursuits and whatnot. 
Yeah, I love that. So what would you say as a coach, what advice do you typically offer to families seeking to strike a better balance between paid work and unpaid work as well as personal fulfillment? So what I think is a really lovely place to start is um, inviting your family to regroup on your values. And the amazing thing about these family units, right, that we live in, that we flow through life within is we can make our life whatever we want it to be. And every family is so magical and unique in that way. And taking a minute to sort of reflect on how you guys are moving through life as a unit where are you feeling stuck? Um, where are you struggling? And just to say, like, let's pause for a second. Do we have a North Star? Do we know what our values are, what our yes. goals are as a family? Mm-hmm. Are we aligned? Where are we not aligned? And also, you know, honoring the fact that everybody in your family is wired slightly differently, mm-hmm. right? We have different goals and different needs, and we approach tasks and differently. So many. Um, And so understanding that and respecting that and just saying like, what do we want for ourselves? Mm -hmm. And knowing that, understanding what it's going to take to get there, including all these beautiful tasks of home and care that we have to get through every day to, again, maintain our space and and maintain our, our health and safety and protect our investments and and understand, you know, the importance of all hands on deck for this again, unlearning like the gendering of this stuff, yeah. critical for future generations, right? Because we don't want this for our daughters, no, no. you know, to, to grow up knowing that they're going to carry 75% of the load. We live in a time now where we tell girls that they can do anything, that yep. they can fly, that they can code, that they can be president and they can. But what are we taking off their plate to make the space for that? And what are we teaching young boys mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so that they grow up to leave the space for girls to thrive in that way? And so it's really all about reconnecting as a family and reflecting on where you want to move as a family unit and then creating the family standards that will support that. Are you a high achieving woman feeling the weight of success yet struggling to find balance in your personal and professional life? If your mind is constantly racing with endless to-dos, family demands, and the unspoken competition between career and marriage, you're not alone. It's time to peel back the layers and address the deep-rooted challenges. You've tried it all, vacations, bedtime schedules, restructuring your calendar, and heartfelt conversations with your husband. Despite your best efforts, the struggle persists leaving you feeling unheard and stuck in a cycle of frustration. I get it. I've been there too. But here's the game changer. Empower X with me. A four-month invite-only experience crafted exclusively for high-achieving women like you. This meticulously curated group is your sanctuary for support, knowledge sharing, and a community committed to scaling businesses while enriching family life. Picture this, virtual mastermind meetings with a sprinkle of coaching every three weeks lasting two hours where you'll engage in deep dives into your challenges. It's a space for high impact skill sharing, fostering growth and unlocking breakthroughs in both your personal and professional life. As if that's not exciting enough, EmpowerX features an exclusive in-person retreat hosted by me in San Diego. Imagine practical workshops, meaningful connections, and a chance to strengthen our community bonds in a breathtaking beach setting. And the support doesn't stop there. With continuous access to our private messaging channel, you're just a message away from the guidance, advice, and camaraderie you need, including direct interaction with me. Ready to break free from the cycle and embrace a life where success doesn't come at the cost of your well-being. Apply now to Empower X. It's time to prioritize your aspirations, enhance your marriage, and approach motherhood with newfound confidence and support. Your journey to intentional living starts here. 
go to veronicacisneros.org forward slash empower x. Again, that's veronicacisneros.org forward slash empower x. I'm so excited to meet you. What would you say are some of the issues you personally ran into with your family when you were starting to create this shift? I know for myself, um, when I started creating this shift, there there was a grieving period. I didn't even know that that's what I would call it. Um, mm-hmm. But who I was and, and, and then my dreams and my goals and my career, like there was a huge shift in the family dynamics, you know, not yeah, only for, for me sure. personally, but the, for the kids as well as my husband. Um, so what would you say were some, some issues that arose maybe in your marriage, um, even maybe as a mom, because you go from, you know, being totally in tune to now there are things that you're doing um, outside of the home. Can you walk us through some of the, some of maybe yeah. the, the road bumps? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, for me, a huge opportunity was learning how to create and keep boundaries. Yes. Um, I had been someone who really did believe that everything was my responsibility. And I took that on with a level of pride. Yeah. Um, and it was informed by all of these things that were taught as women, right? That are sort of falsehoods like, oh, you know, mother knows best and baby wants mama and mm-hmm. the motherhood mm-hmm. instinct and women are better multitaskers, women are better nurturers, and all these things that really are not factual, yeah. but are but are handed to us to sort of convince us that we're somehow uniquely wired to do all this work. And I did take that on, uh, that responsibility. And unlearning that and creating some really important boundaries for myself was um, a, a process uh, for me. Um, And also another challenge for me in creating systems for our family is that my husband has a job where he travels a ton. And so he is away from the family three, four days a week. And so we had to have a lot of conversations about the fact that he could still be a contributor remotely. And we had to figure out all of the ways in which he could do that or else I was really uh, left at home holding 100% of everything, which isn't sustainable. No, no, no. Um, What type of hard conversations did you and your husband have to have to kind of navigate through this and what helped? Um, I think it was really, first of all, a, a consistency of connection and conversing around this. Um, Getting back to the boundaries, I think as he started to sort of take on more roles, he Mm -hmm. would still really lean on me a lot um, for support and contribution, even within that one task. And so it was really, really important that I had a firm wall up such that he learned to own the complete task. So as an example, he said he would take on um, our kids' travel sports. Mm -hmm. They both play travel soccer. But then he would still pepper over to me like, oh, can you just... Can you just load their headshot no. into the portal? You know, can you no. just like see if this person's available for carpooling? And I really had, yeah. I had to give it a hard no. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and then it kind of made him realize, like, okay, I hear you. Yeah, this is this is part of the task. Like, yeah. if I'm really going to own it, I yeah. have to own it. Um, and that is the beauty of systems because when one partner owns something completely the other partner can release it completely, yes. including the mental load of it, right? Which is so liberating. Then you realize like, oh, I have space to breathe. Like I, yeah. there, there's all this stuff going over there that like I trust someone else to do and I don't worry about it anymore. I don't think about it anymore. So Lori, um, I'm going to interrupt you real quick because I could already yeah. hear a couple, not a couple, a whole lot of my audience members saying, well, wait a minute. Yeah. What if you do that? What if you say, no, that's a hard no. And they still don't do it. And then the picture doesn't get downloaded. And then, you know, he misses this or our child misses this. Those are part of the consequence. There are consequences on both ends. 
for yes. setting setting and respecting boundaries, right? There's consequences yep. for the person that chooses to, you know, walk, you know, disrespect the boundary. And there's our, there are consequences for us who are setting the boundary. Um, and so what was, can you walk us through, like, when you're setting these hard boundaries and you're like, it's not going to happen. You know, sometimes our partner may not rise to the occasion every single time. Um, how did you handle that? So the first step that's really important here when you're empowering someone as an owner of a task, it's not just that. like- I love how you say that. I'm empowering my husband with this task. I love how you phrase that. I'm going to use that. I don't think if he, I don't think he thinks it thinks it, thinks of it like that, but that's exactly what's happening. I love it. It it really is. And right? and it's, you know, if it's something that I have been doing and I know inside and out and I have been doing so much of it sort of in my head. Yeah. I have to full of grace yeah. Um, give him, like, you don't give someone a recipe with a missing ingredient. You want yeah. them to succeed, right? So you say, listen, here are all the things that are involved in this. Like, I want yeah. you to be fully aware of the scope. These are all the big parts. These are all the small parts. This is the frequency. This, These are the phone numbers of the people that you have to check in. Like, whatever yeah. it is, you do give them all of the information. And of course, there's a learning period where you have to be open to questions and support. But exactly to your point, like there, there may be some natural consequences that occur. And just like when your child says that they don't want to wear the jacket and you're like, okay, you're like when you feel freezing cold, then you'll realize. Yeah. It's, it's similar, right? And obviously, you're not going to risk anything major, right? Like you're not going to risk missing the deadline for a college application or something. Yeah. Um, but definitely there's a learning curve and and definitely it helps for the owner to experience the the stumbles and fumbles yeah. firsthand a thousand percent and and knowing that going into this you know it's a big transition for the family it's a big transition for us our partner um knowing that going into it um will definitely help with maybe any conflict that arises um my next question can you share a particularly impactful moment or story from your work that illustrates the transformative power of meaningful family conversations or recognizing the value of unpaid work? That is a big one. That's a big, heavy question. <laughs> I'll tell you, um, I, I hope this is a good example. It may not exactly answer your question, but I think it'll illustrate something important and it came to mind. So I'll just share and you can tell me if you want more. Um, as a coach, I guide um, couples and very often women will come to me first for support with systems and and language and boundaries yeah. in the home that will lead to increased equity, decreased um, stress and resentment. And I was working with a wonderful woman who was focused on the unpaid care stage. Mm -hmm. And um, we were meeting one day and she said to me, well, I have to go because I'm meeting with a bunch of the other moms at school to plan the father-daughter dance. Yeah. And I was like, that is just it right there. Yeah. The, the women are taking time, making space, um, providing all of their creative effort to plan a dance for men and mm -hmm. their child. Mm -hmm. And we, you can question the legitimacy of, you know, father-daughter dances and things that are gendered like that in, in today's day. And a lot of people have stuff to say about that. But the point is that the men are not planning that dance. Yeah. And it was such a bubble bursting moment for me about how we look at unpaid work and who we charge with this effort and with this contribution. Yep. And it was so funny because not long after I had that meeting, I was asked by my kids' school to plan uh, this year's fundraiser. Yeah. And because I focused on the launch of my book, I had to decline for this year. And they said to me, well, 
do you know any other moms who could do it? And I said, what about dads? Yeah. Like, why are you I'm sorry. singularly focused on engaging yeah. women, right, in this community work, which is obviously, you know, very soul nourishing, meaningful work, yeah. but why shouldn't men also be a part of experiencing that? And yeah. surely they have just as, as much uh, creativity to contribute and organizational skills Thousand and surely they care percent. just as much about the kids. And so I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but it was, it was a conversation that I had that was such a powerful illustration of just the the societal inequity and the yeah. belief that women need to bolster all of this unpaid labor and our opportunity to really unlearn and reframe that. I did this podcast episode recently about being the default parent and mm. um, the issues that arise in a relationship and even with yeah. you know parenting on how we are automatically assumed you know, to that, that we're the ones that need to take on this role. Um, and it's, it's ridiculous. You know, you're over here writing a, a, a book, like an author. And it's like, are you, are you for real right now? Um, it's, it's just one of those things like, gosh, you know, it's, it's kind of like this stab to the chest, you know, because yeah. women do big, badass things too, you know, for and sure. for us to be dismissed, you know, um, and I can't say that we're dismissed across the board every day, all day. I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm not going into, I'm not going that route, but yeah, that comment, that, that comment would definitely like strike a nerve for me because it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, I'm going to tell you right now, my husband could probably participate at a way greater level than me, right? He's way more organized. And if things need to be cooked or things need to be made, he's your go-to, right? Like, I'm, That's it. I yeah. I don't have that capacity, and I nor the bandwidth to to do that. Or maybe that's just not even something that I'm an expert at. You know, but it's just yeah. Gosh, that's so frustrating. It is. It's so <laughs> so frustrating. I it brings me to a moment with um, you know, we were we were doing a, we had we had a meeting with um, we we're going over um college, you know, for our kids and. And, um, like really prepping the work and it's like, oh, okay, well, if, if just the mom could come, you know, we'll be fine. And it's like, excuse me, my husband's a part of this too. And if just the dad can come, actually my dad or my, my husband was working on her with the entire list and yeah. he was able to, you know, whiz through the app that they gave us a lot quicker than I was, you know, yeah. um, I'm going to have the questions, but he's definitely going to have most of the answers that you guys are going to be asking. So it's just like, what? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no. I mean, you know, when your child is sick at school, who gets the phone call? Yeah. Right? Don't call me. Which, I'm sorry. I'm changing which, lives right now. Don't call me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, very often institutions like schools, like doctor's offices, um, you know, any athletic involvement mm -hmm. that your kids may have, they do default to the mom in yeah. many cases. And so there's an opportunity for parents to say, actually, we would prefer that we are both notified, you know, if yeah. something is up. Um, and so that's something that parents can do to say, no, we're both in the game here. Mm -hmm. So please let it include us both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've had to change ours to my husband being the number one. Um, he mm -hmm. works from home and then mine, um, because I'm in session, I'm, I'm, I'm with patients. Um, you know, mine being either our, you know, they have our, my business, the office line for my assistant or mine. But, mm -hmm. I'm not as accessible, ladies, right? Like I'm not I'm not as accessible, right? Like gosh. My last question, what do you hope um readers and audiences take away from your book um and the importance of it? So, first of all, I I wrote a children's book because I think that this is a conversation if we really want to break cycles yeah. for the future that, you know, ideally it's going to happen in families is as early as possible. But I hope that families with kids of any age 
um, can be inspired by the idea of sparking family conversations um, to reflect on the way that your family moves through life and all the things that are involved in that and who is participating in that work of care. And um, I, I wrote this book really because so many mothers were saying, I cannot, I can't get my kids to participate in, in chores. Right. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. so I, it was, first of all, one more thing on the to-do list of women to figure this out. Yeah. Um, but also it's a hard conversation to start for anybody. And so I wrote this book to start that sort of as a, as a hopeful spark for families. And, you know, it, it really positions this as the work of love not as dreaded, repetitive, unappealing tasks, but as the way that we care for each other in this beautiful life. And I positioned it as work that is for everybody um, and as work that we can really be proud to contribute. So I mm-hmm. hope that it it, it makes um, families hopeful and less stressed and more connected. I love that. I love that. Um, can you show us your favorite page in that book? Oh my gosh! Well, I love the cover. Because I know. I, I love, love, love my love the family. Cover. <laughs> I love that. Um, but it I, kind of looks I, like my family. My husband, right? when he cooks, he puts on the apron. He has a whole, and he has like a specific, legit restaurant apron, especially when he cooks um, for Mother's Day. <clears throat> oh, I love this. So it's really just, um, I'll read you this, um, I'll, I'll, if, you, if I may. Please, I'll please, pages. please, please. Um, so the, the book really is um, to illustrate the scope of work that a family takes on yeah. and the value, the beautiful meaning and value of this work. And then it gives kids a chance to reflect on what they're already doing yeah. of such value that they might not even realize. And so on this page, I say... It's funny to get so excited about things we may think of as chores, but what if you thought of it this way? Each job is a hug at its core. The work of a family is wrapped up in love, actions that all are supreme. And whomever you think of as family, you all are truly a team. Look all around the room you're in. What's special about this space? And peek at the person you're reading with. Notice their beautiful face. Reach inside for the feelings that make your heart sing and glow, that connect to the hearts of your family in a way you all secretly know. And then it goes on to show sort of the the benefit, the fruits of all of this Mm -hmm. effort, which is an opportunity for community and for fun. Um, and so it's really just this opportunity to reframe this work that we sort of sometimes really struggle because it is a lot and we are tired. But yeah. if you can shift your mindset and if you can shift the way that you communicate with your family about it, and and kids are the best, right? Kids are so thoughtful. They want to be trusted. They want to be a part of important things. Yeah, so they how do. you model this work right? They'll have more of a stake in it if they can, if they can see it and understand the meaning behind it. And so that's what I'm trying to do with the book. I love it. I love it. I love it. So for the ladies that want to work with you, right? How do we find you? So, um, my website is our home, our pride.com. And when I talk about pride, please know that this is not a pride in perfection. It's about a pride of feeling safe and happy in your own space, in your own skin, without fear of judgment, without concern for anyone else's standards, only your own. Um, and I, my Instagram is the same. My handle is um, our home, our pride. Uh, LinkedIn on Lori Sugarman Lee, and our home is available anywhere books are sold. Yay, Lori! Thank you so much for being on. It was an absolute pleasure. Um, I'm so excited to see how well your book goes. I'm excited to get a copy. I love it and share it with, you know, I have, I have a group practice, share it with them. Thank you so much again. Thank you. That's so kind. I appreciate all your encouragement. Absolutely. (laughs) 
Raise your hand if you are ready to level up your marriage for 2023. Do you find that you're spending your time together with your husband, checked out, and in front of the TV? I know you're ready for tangible strategies that actually get you results. Reignite the spark in your marriage, have fun, and grow together. Well, I hope you have your hand raised at this minute because I have something special for you. I'm introducing my brand new six question marriage predictor quiz that's going to give you personalized results to catapult you into the next stage of your marriage journey. That means you'll receive the results to where your marriage can get the best help. If you've got just one minute, head to veronicacisneros.org forward slash quiz. Again, that's veronicacisneros.org forward slash quiz. And you could take my brand new quiz, Marriage Predictor. Get your results delivered right to your email address. Again, that's veronicacisneros.org forward slash quiz. veronicacisneros.org forward slash quiz. What's up, ladies? Just want to let you guys know that your ratings and reviews for this podcast are greatly appreciated. If you love this podcast, please go to iTunes right now, write a review, rate the episode, and subscribe. Don't forget to share it with your friends. I'm Madeline, and I'm the host of the Happiest Sober Podcast. I got sober in my 20s after a decade of gray area drinking, and the greatest plot twist of all time was realizing that alcohol, the thing that I thought made my life the most happy and fun and exciting, was actually the exact thing preventing me from living my happiest and best life. My mom is 40 years sober, and she joins me on my podcast very often. I like to call her my part-time co-host, and I also bring you solo episodes where I share my top tips, tricks, and mindset shifts in sobriety, and lots of how to's for navigating all the things sober from weddings to parties to holidays to bachelorette parties to trips. I'm also joined by so many guests who come on and share their sober stories and they're all so, so inspiring. I'm here to show you that life doesn't end when you quit drinking. In fact, it's very much the opposite. And no matter what your relationship was with alcohol, life can be the absolute happiest when you're sober. New episodes come out every Tuesday. You can listen to Happiest Sober Podcast wherever you get your podcasts.